I am uh, joined today by Dr. Ohad Ainov. He's a staff surgeon in orthopedics at Hadassah Medical Center in Jerusalem. He's with me to talk about an absolutely incredible surgical case, um, something that uh, is is you know terrifying to uh, most non-orthopedic surgeons, and I imagine is fairly scary uh, for spine surgeons like him as well. A case of internal decapitation um, that's generated a, a lot of news uh, really around the world because uh, this happened to uh, a young boy. And uh, But what we don't have is information really about how this worked from a medical perspective. So first of all, Dr. Einav, thank you for making time to speak with me today. Thank you for having me. So can you tell us, um, uh, about this boy, about Suleiman Hassan, and, and actually what happened to him before he, he came into your care. Hassan is a 12 years old uh, child who uh, was riding his uh, bicycles on the uh, West Bank, something like 40, 40 minutes away from here. And unfortunately, he was uh, involved in a motor vehicle accident um, where he suffered from uh, injury to his uh, abdomen and injury to the cervical spine, and he was transported into our service uh, with a helicopter by the scene of the accident. So, so you know, d damage to the cervical spine might be something of an understatement here. He he had, uh, you know, what's what the technical term I guess is atlanto occipital dislocation, colloquially often referred to as internal decapitation. Can you tell us what that means? It obviously sounds terrifying. Yes, yes, definitely. So it's primarily injury to the ligaments uh, between the occiput and uh, the upper cervical spine, uh, often with or without a uh, bony fracture. Uh, the atlanto occipital joint is actually formed by superior articular facet uh, of the atlas and the occipital condyle, uh, which are subalar articular surface uh, with the capsule that actually articulate between the head and uh, the neck and supported by various ligaments around it uh, that stabilize the joint and actually uh, actually uh, help us in uh, the joint movements, which mainly is flexion, extension, and definitely some rotation in the lower levels. Right. And of course, this is a, a, a joint, yeah, that has, you know, several degrees of freedom, which which means it needs a lot of support. Um, this type of injury where you have, uh, you know, sever essentially severing of the of the ligaments, um, is it usually survivable or, or how dangerous is this? Yes. Yeah, so the mortality rate is approximately between 50 to 60 percent, according to some of the papers uh, that actually uh, found now on the web. And between 50 to 60, it depends on the transportation. Uh, obviously, the injury, I'm sorry, the, the primary impact, the injury, transportation later on, and um, uh, and then later on, obviously, the surgery and the surgical management. So, so, so tell us a bit about um, his status when he came to your medical center. Um, I assume he was in bad shape. Hassan arrived to our uh, medical center with Glasgow Coma 15. He was fully conscious. Uh, he was hemodynamic stable, except a bad laceration on his uh, abdomen, which uh, uh, obviously was seen. And uh, he had uh, Philadelphia collar on his neck. Um, he was transported by a chopper because the uh, paramedics decided that he, uh, or suspected that he had neck injury. Uh, cervical spine injury, and uh, at the uh, place of the incident, they decided to bring him into a level one trauma center with a, uh, a chopper. Um, over here, he was obviously monitored, um, and obviously we treated him by the ATLS scheme, um, and then later on, uh, we uh, understood what his general uh, situation. He didn't have any motor deficit. He didn't have any uh, sensory. Uh, gross deficit, but he was a little bit confused regarding to hold this, the whole situation, the whole uh, uh, event or accident. We decided as a team that it will be better to cool down the situation and control the situation. Uh, we decided not to operate on him on the spot. And then uh, basically we stabilized him. We made sure that he didn't have any internal organs uh, 
uh, traumatic damage, and then later on we took him to the OR and uh, performed surgery. Um, I, that's, a, that's amazing that he was, you know, had motor function intact considering the extent of his injury. Um, obviously, the, the the spinal cord, I I guess, was was spared um, somewhat uh, uh, during the injury. There must have been a moment when you realized that this kid who was conscious and could move all four extremities had a very severe neck injury. Was that in the the, was that due to a CT scan or physical exam? And, and what were you, what was your feeling when you saw, oh, this person has atlanto-occipital dislocation? So um, obviously you have, a, as, a, as, a, as a physician, as a surgeon, you have a gut feeling in regarding to the general examination of uh, the patient, but I never rely on uh, gut feeling. So, uh, so um, after I saw the CT, I understood exactly what he had. And I understood exactly what we need to do and the time frame. I, yeah, I, I, I can imagine um, uh, the, the, the feeling about that. Now, you've, you've done these types of surgeries before, right? I mean, it, obviously, no one has done a lot of these because this isn't very common. But um, you say you knew what to do. Did you, did you have a plan? Um, it, you know, where does your experience uh, come into play in a situation like this? So I uh, graduated in uh, the spine program of uh, Toronto University where I did uh, my fellowships over there. Uh, I did fellowship in trauma of spine and I did fellowship in complex spine surgery and obviously degenerative as well. Um, so I actually knew what to do. I had a very, very good uh, teacher and I had few cases similar, not the same uh, in actually all the population which I uh, treated in uh, my fellowship. And therefore, uh, I, I knew exactly what, what needed to be done. So, so for those of us um, you know, who, aren't, uh, who aren't surgeons, um, take us into the OR with you. This is obviously an incredibly delicate procedure. You are high, high, high up in the spinal cord, base of the brain. You know, the, the slightest mistake can have absolutely devastating consequences. Um, what are the key elements of this procedure and what are the, what's the most terrifying thing? What can go wrong here? What is the, what is the number one thing you have to look out for when you're uh, trying to fix an internal decapitation? So I think that the key element in these type of surgeries uh, of the cervical spine, regardless if we're talking about trauma, or we are talking about like complex spine surgery. I think that the key element is planning. Uh, I never get into the R without knowing what I'm going to do, without I have uh, a, a few plans. So like plan A, plan B, plan C, if something uh, uh, fails. So definitely I know what's going to be in the next step. I always uh, think about the surgery a uh, few hours usually before, if I have time to prepare. Uh, so this is probably the first thing that is very, very important. The second thing that's very, very important is teamwork. Uh, all the team need to be coordinated. Everybody, everyone in the OR need to do to do his job, to know what his job is. Uh, in these type of injuries, no time for rookies. Uh, if you are new at OR, please stand back. Let the most uh, experienced people to do their job. And I'm talking about uh, um, surgeons, nurses, anesthesiologists, everyone. Um, so. This, I think, is one of the second, uh, or the second, probably the second most important thing uh, that uh, we need to do when we're getting into the OR. Um, obviously, in regarding to planning, um, it's choosing the right um, hardware. So for example, in this case, uh, we had a problem because uh, most of the hardware uh, designed for adults. And here we have to improvise because uh, not, not a lot of hardware is in the market nowadays, definitely not here uh, for, for pediatrics uh, uh, population. Usually the adult plays uh, too big or, uh, and, the, and the screws are too big. Uh, so basically we had to, to improvise. Um, so tell us about that. What, how, how, do you, how do you improvise a, a, a spine, spinal hardware for a 12-year-old? So in this case, I, uh, in this case, I chose uh, to use one of the companies that actually work with us. I can show you uh, here, sorry. So you can see in uh, this model, uh, which uh, in this area was the injury, for example, and this is the area that we actually worked on. And 
in order to perform the surgery, I had to uh, to use some place and some uh, roads uh, of different company. So this company, for example, it's a uh, invasive. So they have these small attachments to the skull, uh, which actually was very very helpful uh, in order to um, to fix his skull into the cervical spine um, instead of using long big plate that actually will sit in the base of the skull and will not be actually very, very good for him um, since the, the, most of the hardware, like I say, uh, are for adults and not for kids. And, and, and will that hardware preserve the, um, the motor function of the neck? I mean, will he be able to turn his head and, and you know, extend and flex so, the neck? So in this case, the, the, the injury actually lead to instability. Uh, and destruction of uh, both of the of the articulation between the head and the neck, and therefore those articulations are are not going to be able to function as articulation in the future, and therefore there is a decrease of something like fifty percent of the uh, flexion and extension uh, of uh, husband's cervical spine, uh, and therefore I decided that in this case there is no 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 chance to save uh, husband motor function actually to save husband life. Um, uh, but to perform a uh, fusion between the head and the neck. And therefore, I decided uh, that this will be probably the best procedure with the best survival rate. So in the future, he will have some diminished uh, flexion and extension and rotation as well. Tell us how long a surgery like this takes or how long did his surgery take? Oh, to be honest, I don't remember. Um, I'm <laughs> <That> sorry. <long. laughs> I'm, I'm performing a lot of the cervical spine surgeries. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't remember exactly, but I can tell you that it took us time. It was very, very challenging to uh, coordinate between everyone. I think that the most um, problematic part of the surgery is probably um, to perform uh, what we call flip over, so to flip the patient. Uh, we anesthesiologist actually anesthetize the patient when he's uh, lying on his back, and then later on we need to uh, flip him down in order to operate the cervical spine. Uh, this maneuver actually can uh, lead to injury by itself, and injury in this level is obviously fatal injury. Um, so we took our time. Uh, first, Hassan got into the OR, and then uh, obviously the anesthesiologist did a great job with the glidoscope, uh, they intubated him, inserted the endotracheal tube, uh, and then uh, later on, uh, we neuromonitored him. So basically, we connected Hassan um, uh, peripheral nerve into a computer. Uh, by that, we monitored his um, uh, motor function, and gently, we flipped him over. After we flipped him over, we had a little bit change at the motor function and therefore we had to do some uh, some uh, modification and position uh, Hassan in better way so we'll be able to preserve his motor function and then later on we actually went to start the procedure which took us um, a few hours, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, that just speaks to how delicate this is, you know, for everything from the, the intubation, which obviously typically you're, you're, you're manipulating the, the, the head for an intubation to the repositioning. Um, uh, yeah, clearly needs a lot of teamwork. Um, so so t tell us, you know, what happened after the operation? How did how did he do? How is he doing? So after the operation, uh, Hassan actually had um a great recovery. He's doing well. He doesn't have any motor deficit. He doesn't have any sensory deficit. He's able to ambulate without any aid. Um, no signs of um, any um, infection or things like that that may happen in a, a, a car accident. Um, not from the abdominal wound and definitely not from the uh, occipital uh, uh, cervical uh, surgery. Um, he feels well, he visited already at the, at the clinic, we removed his collar, uh, we monitored him at the clinic, uh, look amazing recovery for us. Yeah, that, that's incredible. Um, congratulations. Is there, Thank you. is there long-term risks for him that you need to be, you know, uh, looking out for? Yes. And that's actually the reason that we, uh, monitor on him. 
uh, as you probably know, post surgery, there are things that we monitor post surgery. So after the surgery, uh, while the patient is still admitted at the hospital, we monitor his uh, motor function, sensory function, and obviously wound healing. In the clinics uh, at the post-op period, something like a few weeks after the surgery, uh, we monitor for the hardware, for any hardware failure, and uh, bone graft. We check for healing of the bone graft and both substitute we actually put in order to heal those uh, bones. Now, he'll, he'll grow, right? I mean, he's, he's only 12. He still has some years of growth in him. Is, is he going to need more operations, sort of hardware upgrade? So I think, I hope not, because I, um, I, I, I never lay on my, on, my, on my surgeries. I never lay on the hardware for long durations. So if I decide to do, for example, fusion, so I relay on the hardware for a certain time, certain amount of time, and then uh, obviously I hope that they, or I'm planning that the biology will do uh, the work. So uh, if I prefer plan for fusion, so um, I definitely put bone graft in a prepared area for uh, a fusion. And then uh, if the hardware will fail or I will need to take out the hardware, obviously, uh, there will be no change in the condition of the patient. Well, Dr. Einov, what uh, what an incredible story. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's clear that you um, you and your team kept your cool uh, despite a very high acuity situation with a ton of risk. And um, what a tremendous outcome that um, this boy is not only alive, but fully functional. Um, so congratulations to you and your team. Um, that was very strong work. Thank you very much. Um, I would actually would like to uh, thank uh, my team, our team. Uh, always, we have to remember that the surgeon is not standing alone at the door. Um, Hassan's story is actually a success story of very, very uh, big group of people uh, from various uh, backgrounds and uh, religion. They're doing, the day, they're doing the days and nights in order to uh, help people uh, to save life uh, globally. From the paramedics to the anesthesiologist, uh, the traumatologist, the pediatrician, and the nurses, uh, physio physiotherapists, and obviously uh, the surgeons, um, big thank you. His story is our success story. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it is, it is inspiring to see so many people come together, um, to do, uh, to do what it is we all are, are here for, which is, uh, you know, to fight against suffering, to fight against disease, to fight against death. Um, thank you for keeping up that fight and thank you uh, for joining me here on Medscape. Thank you very much.